morning, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. <laughs> Everyone's talking today. A lot of fellowship going on. <laughs> All right, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for just allowing us the freedom to be, to meet together. We just pray to have a, a good fellowship, especially with the email following the service. Uh, we thank you for just, just allowing us to, to be here as a family, a church family, and we just pray just to help us to worship you with our uh, truth and in spirit. We just pray just uh, bless this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you please stand as we open with the song, I Love You, Lord, that's hymn 78, and we do a key change also. In your bulletin for the announcements, I'm just going to cover a few just quickly. You have your days of praise here. Uh, that's out in the, in the foyer, just like your daily bread, just a different, uh, obviously different company. But uh, days of praise, if you are interested in that, they are here and out in that foyer there. Today is our luncheon, so we ask you to stick around for lunch and, and join us for just that food and fellowship as well. <clears throat> so we'd love to have you be there for that time. And... Uh, and eating and, and fellowshipping with each other. And uh, just quickly, and just uh, looking ahead, uh, you do have uh, Lori Crane's Bible study uh, this week. And then next Sunday, next Sunday is a vacation Bible school meeting. Another vacation Bible school meeting that's for everybody to be there. Uh, shouldn't be super long, but just want to kind of get everybody on the same page. Everybody knows what they're doing and uh, go from there and then vacation bible school starts the following tuesday or following sunday so vacation bible school starts two weeks from tonight to, from tonight so uh that's coming up as well there too and then you um also have a uh a, a um sympathy in the um bulletin from diane for diane and the family there in the loss of of john as well so continue to be praying for the family in this most difficult time, encouraging God, uh, or enc encouraging uh, for God to use us to be an encouragement to Diane and Deanne and the family as well too. So those are just the brief announcements that we have for this morning. You can read up on all the other ones as well. At this time though, I'm gonna call uh, one of our missionaries. Just uh, We just took on Dean here uh, just this past year, beginning of the year. One of our new missionaries, he's not new to the mission field, but he's, he's new. And he's not even new, new to us either. He's been here before. You were here with, uh, with one of the choirs, right? That's right, four years ago. That's right. The all children's, the orphans. all the orphan children's choir, he was there with them. So uh, he's been doing things all over the place. He's going to give you an update on what he's doing, where he's at, where he's going, how the Lord's working. So uh, one of our missionaries, Dean Kirshner. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Great, Tim. Thank you. So good to be here. Um, I am Dean, 
And most of you probably don't remember me, but you do remember all the, those 10 children. I had five girls, five boys. How many of you remember them? Bright yellow dresses, right? So if you're like Al, Al didn't remember me a bit, but that's, that's okay. We're supposed to decrease and he's supposed to increase and we're supposed to lift one another up. But um, I am uh, like Pete Frank. You probably remember Pete Frank. He's been here a couple times. And uh, he works in Vietnam and Asia specifically. Uh, there are six of us within Gospel Inc. And we have different jurisdictions. But a theme verse, here's a verse for you. A theme verse is from Colossians 1. It says that the truth of the gospel is gone throughout the world. Isn't that great? The truth of the gospel is gone throughout the world and it bears fruit. It bears fruit. The gospel is powerful, changes our concept, our worldview, and our own soul, and it bears fruit. You know, what Gospel Link does is, a, is because of that fruit. 500 years ago, there weren't Christians in Zambia. 200 years ago, there weren't Christians in Korea. But the gospel goes out because of missionaries. People go out and spread the gospel. One of my favorite stories from Vietnam, and Pete may have shared this, but, I could, but a good story is worth sharing more than once, right? I'll tell you why. Did you turn the news on this morning? Did you get any good news there? No. You get discouraged, you get depressed, you get overwhelmed with the evil. And the Bible says that good news from a far country is like what? Anyone know? Good news from a far country is like cold waters to a thirsty soul. We're dying for good news. I mean, you think it just everyone was killing and robbing and stealing. But you know what? The church is growing. There's more Christians today on planet Earth than ever before. That's good news. But we're not being told what they are in the main media. So during COVID, God led me as part of my work with Gospel Inc. to start a podcast. I don't know if you know what a podcast is. It's a little bit like a radio program on the internet. You can get it on Apple Podcasts. You can get it on Google Podcasts. You can get it on Audible. You can get it on Stitcher. You can get it on all these. Or you can just go to acupofgoodnews.org. Acupofgoodnews.org. And twice a month, I'm telling a story of what the church is doing, what God is doing. I told this story. This is a true story about a man in Vietnam that worked for the religious police. His job was to find Christians, find churches, and shut them down. But he was amazed at the criminals who called themselves Christians. They didn't swear. They didn't fight. They didn't resist handcuffs. He said, what makes these people tick? He said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what they believe. And he had a big stash of confiscated Bibles. He had no problem getting a Bible, even though he was in Vietnam. He started reading that Bible. He said, it won't hurt me. And that's right, it didn't hurt him. You know what it did? It changed him. And after a few months, instead of persecuting the church, he began bowing the knee to the head of the church, saying, how do I serve you? What do I do? Gospel Inc. met him about 10 years ago. Pete Frank shook that man's hand, came back here and raised support for him. He was able to do more with support from the United States. The whole idea of supporting missionaries is to equip them and strengthen them to go out and spread the gospel. This man just passed away uh, two or three years ago, but for the last seven years of his life, he was able to do more financially than ever before. That's the fruit of the gospel in his life. You know, those children aren't children anymore. Some of them have graduated from high school. One of them, I know if you were again, you remember it was four years ago and they were only here for an hour. One of them is Rhoda Haswell. Rhoda came from a perfectly normal family in Malawi, Africa. Her mom and dad got on their bicycle, which is a step below the Amish carriage, and rode their bicycle to the peanut field one morning and were struck by a vehicle. It's bad news, isn't it? The world is broken. There is disease, there's death, there's loss. She went to bed in a normal family and woke up an orphan. One of our national preachers that I know personally, I've worked with him for many years, he, she stood by him and says, what am I going to do, Dean? He said, I'm already feeding over 50. And now I have one more. She was one of the reasons that God led me to start Harvest Hope Home. It's an orphanage 
in Malawi. And you know how many Americans live there? None. Gospel Inc. believes that national people don't have to be American to love the Lord, don't have to have gone to Bible college in the United States to know Jesus and to be faithful to his word. That orphanage has over 70 kids. We have a school for over 100 kids. And Rhoda has graduated from high school and is praying about what to do next, medicine, teacher. A girl normally orphaned in Africa has very little prospect, but because national people love the word, love the Lord, the fruit of the gospel has gone out into good works, has taught her who the Lord is. Yes, she sang and danced and did a beautiful thing here four years ago, but she's continuing to grow in the Lord and serve the Lord because the gospel bears fruit. Let me give you one more story, because we're not just in Asia, we're not just in Africa. My jurisdiction is the former Soviet Union. I lived in Russia for five years. I married a Russian. We have national preachers in Ukraine. We have 77 of them. None of them have perished. They have an unbelievable opportunity at this time in history, although it's a mixed with great tragedy. We're in Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan may soon become an Islamic state. We're in the Republic of Georgia. No, I don't mean Georgia where Jimmy Carter's from. We're not talking about Atlanta. The Republic of Georgia is a small country that sits between Russia and Turkey. And it's known for bringing tourists in. And I was there working with our national pastors. We have a handful of national pastors from Georgia, but one of the national pastors we work with in the Republic of Georgia is not from Georgia. He is from Iran. He is a refugee. He got out of Iran when he can, could. He is a refugee, illegally, an illegal immigrant, as it were, in the Republic of Georgia, but he's pastoring and working with hundreds and hundreds of Iranians. Right now in the Republic of Georgia, there are over 14,000 Iranian refugees. Never have they heard the gospel before. You come to, I've come to them with a Bible study at 8 o'clock at night. It's supposed to last for an hour. At midnight, I've had to send them home. Hungry, hungry to know the truth. Hungry to know a true God. Let me quick tell you this story. This should take less than two minutes. But I was there, and this couple came. And they were coming to see another American, and he wasn't there. And they were a little disappointed, but I said, you know, it doesn't matter who we are. Let's look at the word of God. So there was a man who looked like a happy Saddam Hussein. Now, that's hard to imagine for us, but he looked very Arabic. I said, what do you do for work? He said, I'm retired. What did you used to do for work? I used to be in the army. Ooh, the Iranian army? I know them. They burn flags. I said, uh, when did you join the army? 1979. Red flag, red flag, red flag. That's when they stormed the embassy. That's when the Ayatollah took over. He, so I'm thinking, is this a trap? Is this a trick? Now, I'm not in Iran. They have got on an airplane and flown to meet me in Tbilisi, Georgia. His wife didn't look Muslim at all. She didn't look Arabic. She looked Turkish. She looked Caucasian. She had a head covering, but it wasn't a burqa. It looked like something a Mennonite lady would wear. I don't know a lot about retired military men from Iran. I don't have all the answers to the Muslim questions, but they had come to ask questions. And I didn't know what question. So I said, well, let's sit down and see what questions you have. So I asked, what, what, what do you want to know? I didn't spend much time on myself. They said, well, our daughter, our daughter was here a year ago. Our daughter watched her brother be baptized. So I don't know if they're upset about that. Our daughter has been telling us things about the Christian God. You see, their daughter lives in Cyprus. She got out of Iran, but mom and dad still live in Iran. She said, we know if we leave Islam, Allah will punish us. But we have a question. Now, all this time, we have to go through a translator, which is a beautiful experience because while you're waiting for the translation, you're praying. Dear Lord, give me something to say. Dear Lord, I don't know what, what, what I'm going to say. Dear Lord, I haven't had time to prepare. What do you want me to give them? She said, our question is, is the Christian God really a God of love? I'm 
thinking, is this a softball? Is this an easy one? Is this the fluff before we get into the Quran and whether Muhammad was a prophet and whether the resurrection was real? I don't know. I mean, is God really the God of love? Can you answer that? You're not sure you can answer that. Can you answer it? Well, you're ready to go with me on a mission field. Let's go, man. And I'm sitting there thinking, why did I get on an airplane flyer? I could have sent my 12-year-old son. Is God a God of love? John 3, 16. 1 John. Corinthians 13. But this is why you pray. Because if we depend only on our knowledge, what are we? We're academic. And so I'm praying, dear Lord, what do I tell him? What do I tell him? And the Holy Spirit prompted me, give her Psalm 23. Like Psalm 23? That doesn't say anything about love. But I didn't have much time to argue with the Holy Spirit. So I said, let's turn to Psalm 23. David, whom they consider a prophet, I said, before David was king, he was a shepherd. And he had a very close relationship with God. That is something the Muslim has never heard of. A close relationship with God? You never have a relationship with God. You fear him and serve him and hope you're good enough. But you don't have a relationship with him. I said, let's read what David wrote. And as we read Psalm 23... In Farsi, she gets a Kleenex out and she's dabbing her eyes. And I realize this isn't a soft pitch. This woman is desperate for hope. This woman is desperate for a loving God. She has never imagined being 55 years old and never having heard Psalm 23. I didn't have to preach. I didn't have to go through anything. I said, does that sound like an angry God? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Look at this shepherd. He wants us to dwell in his house. I didn't have to preach. And the Lord prompted me, take her to the good shepherd. I said, let's turn to Luke 15. And we read that, where the good shepherd leaves 99. And because he loves the lost sheep, he goes and finds the lost sheep. And he saves the lost sheep. And by now... Tears are pouring out of her cheeks. And that Saddam-looking Hussein husband looked, reached up and just tapped her hand and smiled at her and said, it's okay, it's okay. You know, I didn't lead them to Christ. Their daughter had been leading them to Christ. You know who had been leading the daughter to Christ? One of our gospel-supported national people. The gospel bears fruit. I didn't lead them to Christ. They just came to see me so I could help them close the deal. They both bowed their head and confessed Christ and believed that he was God and Lord. We baptized them the next day. And they went back to Tehran. Folks, the gospel is going out. And it's bearing fruit. It is a privilege to be involved in foreign missions. Thank you for your work here and supporting us.
can follow along in your bulletin briefly just to get the updates here on a few prayer requests, uh, those that we have on here in the care and prayer, and uh, just to give you two updates uh, briefly is um, number one is Bill Pratt is tomorrow begins treatment again. Uh, he didn't get the greatest of news with his um, bone marrow biopsy. It, they didn't see much change in it at all. If not, it was a little worse than it was before. So they are uh, doing 28 days of chemo beginning tomorrow, and I believe he gets seven days of the shots beginning tomorrow. So the Monday through Friday and then Monday, Tuesday, following week, he takes the pills 28 days straight, and then they'll do another biopsy and go from there. So can you be praying for them as well, and uh, both him and Judy as they go through through this time. And if you think about them, reach out to them and call them and write them a, write them a note or a card or something. And just encourage them as well. And then um, the other update is Mike Wagner. He's on there. It's Sam Wagner's brother. I believe that he is uh, getting um, some more treatment again. Uh, Dawn had written me this morning here. And uh, I just want to double check, make sure I get it right here. But she says that um, he's in the hospital getting intense chemo in preparation for a bone marrow transplant, transplant later this month or early August. This is a good, not best case scenario, as he has gone into remission, but he has a couple of infections and setbacks. But his daughter is mostly a, most likely a good donor match. So, so they'll be having that. So just be praying for Mike Wagner. That would be Sam Wagner's uh, brother. And so pray that that would go well and, and all of that too. So let me pause and pray and go to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we bow before you today and we thank you for who you are and all that you do for us. We pray today, Lord, as we gather here, may we think today understanding and knowing, Lord, that we gather because of freedom that we have in this country but many others in our world today gather in secret, gather in hidden places because they are not allowed to publicly and openly meet. So Lord, help us to be thankful that we have a church family, a, to be thankful that we can build each other up and encourage each other, edify each other publicly. And we pray for those today meeting in secret, Lord, and in, much, in many ways, their edification and their their testimony and their and their their uh, maturity is most times on an often different level because of the persecution they have a greater hunger for you so lord help us in this nation to not lose that hunger to continue to desire after you for you because of you we pray today for the hurting and sick we ask that you would be with each and every single one Lord, all those going through much physically, we ask that you would meet the needs. We continue to pray that you would remove cancers and various situations if it would be your will. And if you choose not to, we pray that you would give each life and family strength to continue on. Be with them daily in the ups and downs, both physically and emotionally, and in addition to that, mentally as well. We pray that you would be with uh, the Schrack family, continue to be with each of them, Lord, and, and uh, the loss of John. We know that he's with you, and so we praise you because of you, that he is with you, and by, by his faith alone in your finished work. And, uh, but we pray for Diane, the family, Lord, encourage them, strengthen them, Lord, for the remainder of their own lives as well. We do pray, Lord, for uh, each of our missionaries. We thank you for those to whom we're able to support and those that we're not able to support, but Lord, those all over the world today doing what you have called them to do. And help us understand and know, Lord, that we are called uh, to do what you've called us to do in our own backyards as well, too. So in essence, we all find ourselves to be missionaries, all sharers of the gospel as we are called and commissioned to do so. We pray that you would work in every life here today, the ups and downs, the unspoken prayer requests, the many that we pray for for salvation, Lord, we lift them and bring them all before you. We ask that you would work in each heart and mind, strengthen and help, encourage, build up. And Lord, help us most importantly to pray for each other that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Help us to know you more. I ask these things in my own life and much, much more. We ask and thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I'm just going to dismiss the junior church. Junior church, you can just go straight down, straight down to junior church, okay? Go straight down to junior church. And we're going to have you stand one more time and turn in your hymn books to page 634. 634. We're just going to sing the first verse, just the first verse of More Love to Thee, page 634. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the time to allow your word to enter our hearts. But we know that we must have hearts prepared to receive it. Lord, we know the, the uh, wonderful parable of the sower. Lord, we know that the word of God only takes root into the heart, into the, into the ground that is prepared to receive it. That, that, that is which has been tilled and, and processed and, and ready to receive, Lord. But we have so many other things in our hearts and minds that we could have the seed be fought on stony ground or to be stoned, uh, fought, fought on um, uh, ground to which the thorns come up and, and to uh, destroy it. And so, Lord, help us to, to have hearts prepared for it today. And we praise you for it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Continuing our study in uh, 1 John, 1 John, as we continue to expository go through the book of 1 John here uh, these last number of months. And John has, John has gotten so much in in just these few first chapters here as we continue today in our study of 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 to 17 is where we find ourselves here today. But John has just gotten done writing about growing in maturity and loving others. Thank you. And obeying the word of God. In all of these things to which believers ought to be doing. We ought to be loving others. We ought to be growing in our knowledge of God. And there ought to be maturity that is seen. We looked at last week that John talks about three different stages, although we know there are many in-between stages of spiritual maturity, but he pointed out three, little children, young men, and fathers. Little children being those that are babes in Christ, young men being those that are more mature than a babe in Christ, but yet not fully mature as a spiritual father or mother in this case would be. So now we... He changes gears just a little bit, but yet these things all still coming together. And it's important that we, that we understand that as well. That looking to what a believer ought to be. How do we know? How do we know that we are saved? Because we keep his commandments. How do we know that we're saved? Because we have a love for others and a love to reach the lost. And we ought to be growing in our faith, growing in our walk as well. And now he gives us a reminder of what we ought not to be doing. He's told us of what we ought to be doing as believers, but now he's going to tell us what we ought not to be doing. And John is giving us this expectation of those who are born again. Those who are born again. We jump back quickly to 1 John chapter, chapter 2 and verse 6. Just verse 6 of this chapter. And he says here, speaking to believers, He that saith he abideth in him, who is Jesus, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. 
So the application of verse 6 is vitally important. But the application of verse 6 will also come from us not doing verses 15 to 17 as best as we can. So if we abide in Christ, we ought to walk even as Christ walked. And we know that the world loves darkness rather than light. But we also know that in Christ is all light. He is the light and in him is no darkness. We read in this same chapter. So this is what we should desire to strive for, to follow after, is Jesus Christ alone. But we find here that he begins in verse 15. He says these words, and I'll read the passage this morning. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We know these verses fairly well. If you were brought up in any good Bible teaching church, these were covered at some point that we ought to know that we ought not to love the world or the things that are in the world. And we understand John to to be able to point us to this as well. Loving not the world. So it's only right that John tells fellow believers to love not the world. That if we are to be followers of Christ, that if we are to walk even as he walked, then we ought not to be loving the world, neither the things that are in the world. We ought to be different than the world. We shouldn't blend in. I like to hunt, and so I use camouflage. And the purpose of camouflage is to blend in with your surroundings so that the animal to which you are trying to harvest for food and things like that, that they don't see you and notice you because you blend in. And this is not what Christians ought to be. We not ought to be blending in with the world. So when the world sees us, they don't see anything different. They, we just blend in with everybody else. The Bible clearly teaches clearly teaches that you and I as believers, those that are born again in Christ by faith alone in the finished work of Christ alone on the cross, that we are to be set apart, that we are to be holy people. Paul wrote also in 2 Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But he has called us a holy calling. Peter writes, or 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes again and says, And the very God of peace sanctify you, holy. That word sanctify means to be set apart. That you be set apart, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Is that we would find ourselves to be blameless unto the coming of the Lord because he has sanctified you and I. And 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 we are sanctified only by the blood of Jesus Christ. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 to 16, we don't have time today, but I encourage you to write it down, is that we ought to be holy as he is holy, Peter writes. So Christians are not to blend in. We are to be different. But you will only be different, and I will only be different, by the working and the washing of Christ in our life. Sanctification only comes by Christ alone. We can't do it on our own. Or or we do blend in. If we're blending in, that's all us. If we are different, it's all Jesus. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus tells us how to be set apart. And he writes this, this very familiar passage 
or speaks it, I should say, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So what sets us apart? The word of God. And who is the word of God? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 of that same chapter says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So I want to make it clear for you and I to understand that before we begin to look at this text in a greater aspect of loving not the world, we have to understand that we are called to be set apart and different. And if we find ourselves always blending in, then you need to go back and reread the first and second chapter of John of what a believer really is, especially verses 3 and on of this chapter. And hereby we do know that we know him. How do we know that we know him? We keep his commandments. Now, I will say As we've been talking about, even as John says, or else he wouldn't share verses like 1 John 1 9, or he wouldn't share verses like 1 John 1 7, that we are still sinners. And so, us being set apart, being holy, obviously is not going to be all the time 24 7, or Jesus wouldn't call for it, the Old Testament wouldn't say it. And neither would Peter call for it to be holy as he is holy. If we are great at that and perfect at that, there's no reason to ask anybody or to command anybody to do so. So sin is a reality we keep going to. So this area of blending in begins to be a struggle, begins to be, not begins, but it always is, as believers, a battle. It's a battle that is daily. Of loving not the world or the things that are in the world. So to be set apart, to be holy, comes by Christ's death on the cross. But how do we uh, grow in that? It's done by study and application of his word. And not by loving the world, but by loving the word. And so that which we love oftentimes is what we will make time for. What is it that you make time for? And that will show you what you really love. How's your devotional life? How's your prayer life? How is my devotional life? And how is my prayer life? For that which you make time for is often that which you love. Love not the world. This is really something that comes from within the heart. It's, it's, it's really talking about that which we ultimately desire. This word love is the same category or in the same wording is of, of agape love, which is an unconditional love, the way that God loves you and I. But we ought not to love the world, and this is, again, begins in the heart. It's a choice. Love is a choice, and and we choose to love, and we choose to desire those things that which we like. And this is why it's written there um, also in uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So as much as we ought to love others, there are things that we ought not to love as well. The world, the system, the mindset of this world, even the things in it. And what are these things? What is it? It is is anything that pulls you and I away from our desire to the Lord, our desire to be obedient to the Lord. Is Is it edifying my walk? Is it pointing me to the Lord? Does this ultimately please the Lord? Questions we ought to be asking ourselves as well. Is it against what God's word ultimately says and teaches? This we see a compromise within our world today. 
And it really comes down to an understanding not only of the word of God, but that it is inerrant, that there is nothing wrong with the word of God. And people begin to look at it and want to re-clarify what they think the word says. And the word is not for, for you and I to re-clarify. It is to take it in its context into which it's written and to study it in the context in which it's written. And what does it ultimately say? What does it say? Not going into our study and say, this is what I want it to say, and having preconceived ideas, but what does it really say? And I might not like what it says, but I have to believe that's what it says, and if that's what it says, then that is what is true. And so we have to look at the word of God, and you won't know what's pleasing and what's edifying and what's right or wrong without the study of the word of God. As I said, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily battle. It's interesting here that, that John, just finishing up, as we looked at last week, talking about little children, young men, and fathers. Now he comes to this, loving not the world. He doesn't point out any particular stage of maturity. He doesn't say, I'm just talking to babes in Christ here. He's talking to all believers because the, because the struggle of loving not the world is just as difficult for a babe as it is for a father in spiritual maturity. Why? Because sin is still there. Now, yes, should there be hopefully less sin in the, in the life of a, of, a, of a spiritual mature father? Certainly. But sometimes a babe is sometimes better than some of the other ones because a babe is excited. It wants more. You ever see a new Christian? And you're like, hold your horses, buddy. You're a little bit over the top right now, right? But ought not that the way we ought to be? So he's speaking to all believers here, loving not the world, neither the things that are in it. Not easy. We all, we all struggle with this. This is why we have to keep our guard up. You remember Lot, we studied the book of Genesis. We did expository preaching and teaching through Genesis. It took us like two and a half years to go through. But remember the story of Lot. Abraham's nephew, traveling with Abraham, and they got to a point where Abraham said, hey, let's, let, you know, let's go our separate ways here. You can pick, I'll let you pick anything you want, any land you want. Whatever you pick, I'll take the opposite. So Lot looks, and he sees the lushness of, of this area, and he says, well, this is great. I'm going to pick this side. And so Abraham says, fine, that's good. I'll take, I'll take the other side. And then the Lord tells him, Abraham, everything your eyes see, I'm going to give you anyway, right? So Lot goes, and we read in Genesis chapter 13. I want to point something out here. In verse 12, And Abraham dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. And look what it says. He pitched his tent towards Sodom. Okay? We know this. We went through this. Pitched his tent towards Sodom. Now, why does he pitch his tent towards Sodom? Well, we read also in Genesis 13.10, Two verses prior, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord. It was like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. You remember that Abraham and Lot and his family went to Egypt. They were, they were escaping a famine. They should have just stayed where they were because God was going to take care of them. But Abraham left and went to Egypt. Somewhere along that trip, he picked up Hagar, which we know how that story goes. But as they're there, they're in Egypt, and, and, and Egypt is totally the world system. And so as they're there, Lot's saying, man, this looks great here. And so when it comes time to pick land, why does he pick Sodom? Because it looks a lot like the land of Egypt. And so we see that Lot pitches his tent towards Sodom because it reminds him of Egypt. Now we find also, my remote's not working. 
that we also read in Genesis 14. And they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. Now he's dwelling in Sodom and his goods and departed. Remember the kings. The kings would come down. They were going to fight. Uh, there's five kings, I think, four kings on another side. They're going to fight. And they came in. They took Lot and everybody else in that area. So Abraham had to go and save Lot. Well, look where Lot is. Not, he, he no longer is pitching his tent towards Sodom. Now he's dwelling in it. And we know the story when God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah, that who has to escape? Lot and his family. His wife turns around, looks back after told not to, turns into a pillar of salt. So you go from looking at the world to pitching your tent at the world and then saying, I like to be a part of the world. And then you find yourself living there. Now, we all know the great comment of what's been said over the years that we ought, yes, we live in the world, but we ought not to be of the world. Obviously, we have to go through these same things on a daily basis. And we're going to look at these things a little bit deeper. I know my time is short today, but bear with me. The world and all that there is can ultimately draw you and I, just like Lot, if we spend a lot of time fixed and looking and focused on what the world has and everybody else around us has, it's easy to say, I want that too. And so we can find ourselves easily being taken as Lot. Now, we can't shelter ourselves from it. A lot of people try to do that, and I've seen many ways that people shelter themselves their kids and everybody else come out even a hundred times worse. So sheltered that they say, I don't even know anything about it. So sheltering is not the answer either. What is the answer? It's Jesus. It's the word of God that we still must live in the world. But we ought not to rely on it. We ought not to do what the world does. But to be fixed on Christ alone. It says, if, the, if any man loved the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a bold statement that John gives. Why does John say this? He's not saying that there's any middle road. John is ultimately saying you either love God or you love the world. You can't have both. Jesus mentions this, speaking about many things, but about money in this way. He says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't have your cake and eat it too. But this is what we do like. We do like riding the fence, don't we? The world, the culture... Presses upon us on every side. What do we hear all the time? Do you. Do what feels good. It's all about what you think, right? Although everybody's saying that. So nobody. That's why there's so much arguments in the world today. And so much craziness in the world today. Why everybody's so much offended today. Because my opinion is my opinion. But your opinion doesn't matter to my opinion. Because it's your opinion. And, and we're all on the same page. But yet we're all disagreeing. Because I don't want to hear what you have to say. It's only about what I care about. No, it's all about what the word says. That's what it was. This is, this is the common place. This is the common thing that separates it. Do what makes you feel happy. This is what the world's all about. Even many churches are that way. Many churches won't talk about sin, holiness of God, all of those things. Because they don't want to offend. How can you not talk about sin and holiness and yet share the gospel? If you don't talk about sin, there's no need for a savior, is there? If you don't talk about holiness, there's, you, don't under, you don't see your sin. This is how we ought to not see the world, but see the word of God. And it's a battle, as I said. There's no middle ground. 
Look what Jesus said. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. He says in verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, because you're born again, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So again, you can't love that which hates God. What does is, what is Jesus say? The world hated me before it even started hating you. So how can we love something that hates the one that who loves us? Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? But yet, this is what we struggle and battle with every day because, again, sin's reality in our life. We look at three categories of sin, verse 16, and I am going to wrap this up quickly, okay? Don't worry, the food's staying warm and cold. What he says in verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. These three categories of sin, I call them categories of sin because I believe you can take any sin in this world and it will fall under one of these three categories. Any sin, you can pick any sin, it's going to fall under one of these three categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is exactly what Satan used to tempt Eve. He's saying three things. In Genesis 3, 6, let me point it out for you. Look what it says. And the woman, when the woman, that's Eve, saw that the tree was good for food, there is the flesh. The less of the flesh, she saw that it was good for food. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. There is the, there is the eyes. And a tree to be desired to make one wise. There's the pride of life. And what did she do? She ate and gave it to her husband. And he ate too. These things Satan used, the very first sin, the very first sin ever done was all three of these categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. As I said, it's a battle. Paul writes in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So Paul understands the battle of the spirit and the flesh. It is a serious battle. What is the lust of the flesh? Well, many of us ultimately run to and go to, which is true, sexual sin. And that's not the only area of the lust of the flesh, but that is the main area of the lust of the flesh. It's all written through all the Bible. What did Paul write to Timothy? Flee, right? Flee fornication. Paul gives a list of many things. We read it all through the word of God. The lust of the flesh is ultimately goes under a desire to do something. A desire to do something. In Titus chapter 2 verse 12, Paul writes this, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, what should we do? Live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what we're called to do. It doesn't mean we always do it. But as the lust of the flesh is ultimately a desire to do. It's an appetite. You know, when you're really hungry, you say, I'm really craving lunch right now. And Tim's still talking. <laughs> you know how you feel right now? And right now you're battling that hunger. The lust of the flesh is like that. It's just, it's just appetite. It's just craving. For the things of the world. And the way the world does things. The next one is the lust of the eyes. This is what we can see. And this is what we covet. This is what causes us to want. Remember Solomon. One of the most wisest men. Had everything he could have. Ecclesiastes 2.10, look what Solomon says. And what, whatsoever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. 
I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was a portion of all my labor. So everything that Solomon saw with his eyes, he desired, he coveted, and he had. And we know what that is. It's, it's ponds and waters and maidservants and, maids, and manservants. And everything that he wanted, he had. Even, even a peculiar treasure of kings. Everything his eyes wanted, he had. But look what Solomon says. Then I looked at all the works that my hands had wrought and all the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and a vexation of the spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. See, the lust of the eyes is seeing what other people have, what we don't always have, and we want. And that causes us to covet. And we know that's one of the Ten Commandments, do we not? In a lot of areas. Don't cover what your neighbor has. Don't cover your neighbor's wife. But we see that it's the lust of the eyes, that which our eyes see. In Joshua chapter 7, remember, Israel went to go fight against Ai. And God was going to give Ai over to Israel. But Joshua said, okay, let's gather everybody up. They looked it over and said, hey, we could probably take about two, 3,000 men. It's not going to be that big of a fight. So they go over 2,000, 3,000 men, and guess what? First, first 36 guys die. And Joshua backs everybody out and goes to the Lord and says, Lord, what's going on? I thought you were going to give us AI. And God says, there is sin in your camp you, have to, you don't know about. So then Joshua went back and talked to his camp and everybody there, and we know that Achan was there. Look what Achan did. Joshua asked Achan what he did. He says, when I saw among the spoils of goodly Babylon garment and 200 shekels of silver and wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and I took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver is under it. So we see the progression here. He saw, he coveted and took. And what did God do with Achan and his family, they were killed. That's how serious God takes sin. They were killed. Where should our eyes be? Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So we have this sin, and it does weigh us down. And sin is a battle every single day. We deal with it every single day, whether you're a babe in Christ or a spiritual mature father. But how do we do it? What do we do? Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand throne of God. The last one is the pride of life. This is an easy one. This is one that we all deal with. We all have some sort of pride, right? We think everything's about me. You know why you get angry sometimes? Or a lot? Like I do? Because I didn't get what I wanted. That's really where anger comes from. That's really what anger is, right? You, if you really took your anger and, and really broke it down and say, why am I angry right now? It's probably because I didn't get something I wanted or something didn't happen the way I wanted it to go. It's raining today. Why is it raining today? I want it to be sunny. It's all about me. What's in it for me? We often do this even as Christians when we open the word of God. What do I want the word of God to say to me? When we study the word of God, it ought to be, what is... What is it that it says in the context of which it's written? And how, do that, how does that affect my life and what do I do with that? Not that saying, well, I don't like that verse because it's coming down pretty hard on me. Let's go to this other one over here where it says... You know, the church does this a lot, right? You can get on the radio and TV and anywhere else, and you can find sermon after sermon. You know what they're going to tell you to be? B 
Be a good neighbor. Be the best you can be. Live your great life now. Who's it really all about? Not you and me. It's about Jesus. All for Jesus. Right? All for Jesus. That's who it's all about. Not me. But the pride of life swings in daily basis every single time. That's why Paul had to write the church of Philippi. And he wrote them. That, that they would not be have vain glory, that, that they wouldn't have pride, right? Or don't think of yourselves better than somebody else. And then what's he say in that next verse? In, verse? in verse 5, I believe it is, when we're talking about humbling ourselves and, and not putting ourselves in front of other people and things like that. And he goes on to say in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Huh, that sounds pretty similar to what John wrote in 1 John 2, 6. Oh, that, that we ought to self-walk as even as he walked. You know, there's so much more here, but I know you're hungry. Verse 17 says that when you focus on all these things, they will fade away. They all pass away. And that's what Solomon understood when he said all is vanity. You know, the only thing that lasts forever is the word of God. So cling to it. Cling to the word of God because it will never let you down, put you down. It will build you up, encourage you, and challenge you and me too. How do we do this? Well, there was a man by the name of Thomas Chalmers. He's a Scottish minister. He wrote in his book called The Expulsive Power of New Affection. And he gave this illustration about how do we not love the world, but how do we get those, those loves away, but be totally loving God, right? And he says these things. The way dead leaves of winter are removed from some trees is not that people go around plucking all the leaves off. It is new life. The shoot that comes and pushes off the dead in order to make room for itself. The same way the Christian gets rid of such things as bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking and all the malice. The new qualities develop and the others simply have no room to be there. They are pushed out and they are pushed off. So how do we not love the world but yet still exist in it? Number one, we aren't better than the world. I'm telling you that first. We ought to be different, set apart, but we're not better. For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. But what is it that you take the word, that you study the word, that you apply the word? And as the more you take of the word of God, it pushes out the dead things that shouldn't be there. Just like the leaves that come in every, every spring. In the fall, they fall off. So may you and I cling to the word of God. May we cling to Jesus alone and not love the world. Hard to do? You better believe it. But why don't you ask yourself, are you set apart? Are you holy? Are you different? Or do you find yourselves blending in? And I'm not talking about Sunday morning in church. I'm talking Monday through Saturday. Do you wear camouflage? Is your, is your light hid under a bushel? No. Don't let Satan blow it out, right? Much theology in that little song. Cling to Jesus, for he alone is our hope. He alone is our salvation. He alone, by grace alone, by our faith alone in what he's done on the cross, do we have eternal life. Everything else will fade like the grass. Heavenly Father, I thank you.
for this time in your word, so much more there. But I pray that you would help us to grasp what you want us to grasp today. Help us in this battle. Lord, it is a, a difficult battle. Not loving the world or the things in it. And we can so, certainly find ourselves to compromise in many ways. And Lord, we allow the world to dictate how we ought to look at things. We allow the world to dictate how we define things. And yet, Lord, definition has already been said and done in the word of God. And so I pray today that you would help us all to know who you are. That we would love you. And know that it's either loving you or not loving you. There's no in between. But help us with the battles every day. And they are real. The fleshly desires. What we see. What we covet. Our own pride of our own life, Lord. All real things. So, but Lord, help us then those to not be present all the time. But when they are present, may we seek forgiveness. Turn away from them and turn towards you. Help us to be fixed and focused on you alone. To stand and be different. For the world needs to see the light in the midst of the darkness. I ask these things in Tim Kranz's life. For I too struggle with all of these same things. Help us all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing in closing hymn 79, My Jesus, I Love Thee, just the first verse. Father, give us a great remainder of the day. Help us to leave here, Lord, loving you all the more. And we know that can only come by study and your working in our lives. Father, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can head right back, and I'll pray in there for the food. I'll be right there. <laughs>